In this lecture, we're looking at Augustine and the doctrines that he is most famous for shaping in the Western half of the church. And we can begin by remembering what we went through in our last lecture on the life of Augustine. We discussed his rise to the ranks of his career as a real prodigy on the subject of rhetoric in both teaching and in terms of his speaking. We talked about some of his philosophical dabblings, how at times he was a Manichaean, and at times, at least briefly, before his conversion, how he was a Neoplatonist. And then we looked at his conversion and his baptism and his return to North Africa, where in the span of several years, he was ordained as a priest and then eventually as a bishop. And in this lecture, we're going to be looking at Augustine's theology. And we want to be careful, of course, not to divorce the man's thinking from his life. But there is, in fact, so much in Augustine's theology, so much in the large body of writing that he left at his death in 430, that has shaped the Western intellectual world ever since. As we said in our last lecture, Augustine really is, outside of the New Testament, the most prolific and the most important and pivotal writer in all of church history. And this lecture really is an issue of what are we going to leave off. <laughs> There's so much that we could say about Augustine, so much that we want to say, but we can only focus on a few things in this short lecture. And I think perhaps the most important things to focus in on can be arranged into three brackets. And those are sin, grace, and predestination, the sacraments and the church, and finally, Christians and culture. And so we're just going to go through each of these brackets and signal some of the ways that Augustine changes or codifies or clarifies some of the doctrines related to these subject areas. So first, sin, grace, and predestination. Augustine really is, in many ways, the founder of a long-standing tradition and a meditation on the subjects of sin and grace and predestination. In fact, often today, if someone wants to signal that they are holders of a certain position on the inability of the will, or of sin, or of the need for free grace, and by extension, the doctrines of predestination, that if people are going to sum up what they often mean by this, it's not uncommon to hear someone describe themselves as being Augustinian. And what they mean by that, whenever someone says that they're being Augustinian, is that they're speaking to a complex of a number of different doctrines and ideas that Augustine meditated on over the course of his life. Now, the context, in many ways, of Augustine writing on these subjects is the rise of the Pelagian controversy. Pelagius was a writer from Britain, and he had come down and made a few converts and had begun to spread his certain perspective on the role of works in the Christian life. And that proselytizing is what propelled Pelagius onto the scene as an issue for the early church to deal with. And Augustine was his primary opponent. Well, Pelagius taught a number of core doctrines that frankly are almost impossible to square with Scripture. Pelagius taught that sin was, to use modern lingo, bad habits. There is nothing fundamentally wrong in human anthropology, Pelagius argues. We have free will entirely. We have full moral choice entirely. And sin is bad habits or bad patterns of thinking or of action. In other words, Pelagius almost entirely denies any doctrine of sin whatsoever as touching our humanity. Not surprisingly, then, Pelagius believes that salvation is, and this is not hyperbole here, entirely by works. That God has given us the bar to jump over, and it's simply our job to jump over it. In one of his letters, in fact, Pelagius writes that because perfection is possible, it's mandatory. We are to live perfectly, period. Anything short of living perfectly means you are not saved. Pelagianism, in other words, is pure works righteousness, as we say. Which is a bit of a misnomer. It's more that it's pure works salvation. Salvation is achievable by living a perfect life. And Pelagius believes that this is achievable, and therefore it's the duty of all Christian men and women to live perfectly. Again, this is almost impossible, frankly, to square with just about any of the teachings of the New Testament. There are verses that seem to suggest a fair amount of moral sanctity on the part of Christians, but frankly, read in context, it says nothing of this kind, that perfection is required or demanded or else you are 
cast out and thrown into the abyss. Not surprisingly, Pelagius talks not at all about the cross or about the work of Christ on our behalf or about the blood offering that he provides as the covenant keeper and we as the covenant breakers. So, as you can see, Pelagius is a problem in the early church. And Augustine spends a significant portion of his time over the years that he's a bishop writing against a number of the different views associated with Pelagianism. And as a result, Augustine's teachings on sin and grace and predestination have formed the vocabulary, you might say, of just about every conversation that's happened ever since on this subject. And what's interesting about Augustine is he notices that these doctrines all web together. That is to say, he has a very considered position on all of these various subjects because he realizes that they all impinge on one another. So, for example, Augustine lays the foundation stone of his understanding of grace and redemption not on what grace might be like on its own in a vacuum, but rather Augustine begins with humanity, with what we call the doctrine of anthropology. And Augustine begins with this idea of what is known now as original sin. And this really is the kind of inverse or the polar opposite of what Pelagius taught. Augustine says that in Adam we all fell, which is, of course, a quote from the Old Testament. And he sees in the fall of Adam some vital, visceral connection to the sin that you and I experience in our day in and day out lives. Sin for Augustine is not simply bad habits or bad learned patterns of thinking or action. Rather, sin is more visceral. It's more a part of who we are. The fact that we all die, for example, is a sign that built into all of us is sin. There's some original sin, hence the word, that is a part of all of us. And flowing out of that, Augustine talks about the fact that all of humanity after Adam is unable not to sin. He uses the slogan on a few occasions that we are not able not to sin. Obviously, it's a double negative. What he means there is everyone sins. It's simply a fact of life. And Augustine says that the root of this sin is not any one place. The core of it, Augustine says, principally, is in our pride. He looks long and hard at the decision by Adam to take of the fruit, and he notices that it was the pride of Adam that caused him to do so. The devil tempted him with the knowledge of good and evil, and he held out this higher standard, this better life if he just simply disobeys God and does what he wants. And the pride within Adam latches onto that, and he does it. And there's another word that Augustine uses throughout most of his life to describe this impulse of original sin within all of us. And that word is concupiscence. Now, it's important to get this word right. First of all, it's a word we don't really use a lot today, but it's also a word that is wildly misunderstood in the context of Augustine's thought. Concupiscence technically could mean lust or libido. And so when Augustine is talking about the role of sin in our life, he at times says that there is this inner concupiscence towards sin that is driving us in that direction, seemingly at times against our will. Well, a lot of modern commentators, particularly after the sexual revolution, have begun to blame Augustine for negative views on sex, that he was against marriage relationships. And there's a lot of fodder here because of Augustine's lament over his life with a concubine. And then they find this word concupiscence, and they hear that Augustine says that the root of sin in this now, after Adam, is concupiscence towards something. And they say, aha, here's Augustine sexualizing sin and making sex the root of everything. Well, the problem is, is that's actually not what Augustine is saying. Rather, what Augustine is using here is a word that does mean lust, but it means lust in the sense that we used to use the word maybe a hundred years ago or longer. Lust was desire in and of itself that had grown wild and overcome all of its boundaries. Lust today, frankly, only means sex. But in a bygone century, you could have said that one lusted after food or one lusted after power or money or these kinds of things, that there were lusts, plural, within us. It's a bit more like that when Augustine uses the phrase concupiscence. He's not sexualizing sin, but rather he's saying that the root of all of our sins is this pride and this belief 
that I can have whatever I want so long as I want it. And because my desires, because my instincts, my appetites, we might say in the modern world, have grown so foolhearted, have grown so large, that we hunger and have appetites for everything. Well, this really is the nature of sin. At the root of it then for Augustine, it's an impulse and a desire. Sin for Augustine is not a substance. It's not our physical bodies. It's not our souls. Rather, Augustine says in a number of places, sin or evil is not a thing, but the absence of a thing, the absence of good. So whereas Adam was created with appetites and desires and all kinds of things that were within their bounds and used for their created purposes, after the fall, he and by extension all of us have these appetites, these moments of concupiscence, to use Augustine's word, where our desires are based on our pride and our ego and the narcissism of the internal self that wants what it wants, and it's going to get whatever it wants. Now, out of the complex of all of these ideas, of course, Augustine essentially lands on the concept that we don't have, in a manner of speaking, free will. Now, he does say we make free choices in the sense that I make the choices that I want. If I wake up in the morning and I want a whole box of donuts, and if I go buy a whole box of donuts and I eat them, then I'm actually freely choosing to do this. Rather, what Augustine means when he says that we don't have free will in a manner of speaking, or that our will is bound, is that because of the concupiscence, because of that internal pride and narcissism and appetite, that I'm really not free when I go and buy that box of donuts. That actually what I'm doing is I'm compelled, I'm prodded, I'm pushed by my internal desires to want something. And so I succumb to that desire because donuts are awesome. And who wouldn't want a whole box of donuts in the morning? So in a manner of speaking, Augustine can talk about the freedom of our will and also the lack of freedom of our will at the same time. It's a bit like a scale, if you want to use an old analogy. If you were to weigh something on an old scale, you would have a weight on one side and you would put the object on the other side. And if it balanced, then you knew you had an equal amount of whatever weight you had on the scale. Well, essentially what Augustine is saying is that our scale is broken. That if our scales were sinless, if our will was sinless, we could weigh out what is good and what is bad. However, concupiscence, the appetites of who we are, that pride or that narcissism within us, has broken our scale. And so when there are two options in front of us, good or bad, we choose the bad because our scales are weighted towards that. They want that instead of the good. Well, all of this comes down fundamentally in the end for Augustine on the subject of grace and salvation and predestination. If the core of who we are is sinner, we are a sinner. We have this broken will, this impaired will by sin. We have these appetites that we can't suppress, and because of them, we are unable to assess good or evil or the things of God and the things that are not of God. Because we're broken fundamentally in terms of our engagement with God's world, we need, Augustine says, something from the outside to come in and loose the bonds or to repair the capacity of our desires to understand what truly is good and what is evil. Not surprisingly, then, Augustine believes in the doctrine of predestination that God has chosen us, that it's His free grace that comes down that restores our souls, that gives us that freedom back to weigh good and evil once and for all, so that now we can truly want God. The biblical analogy is the heart of stone is taken out and the heart of flesh is put in. And Augustine believes without that, there is no salvation. It's not by works. Perfection is not achievable, he says against Pelagius. But rather, we are bound and we need a Savior to come in from the outside by his spirit, and to regenerate us in order to even desire him in the first place. Hopefully you can see in this, of course, that there's a root of all kinds of subjects that will come home to roost in the Reformation. Calvin and Luther and Cranmer and John Knox and all of these figures from the Reformation will have pretty extensive meditation on Augustine's doctrines of sin, predestination, grace, and justification.
Now, Augustine doesn't anticipate all of the things that they're going to talk about in the 16th century, obviously. But just to give you some of the sense of how important Augustine's meditations are on these subjects, it probably is not an overstatement to say that the entirety of the vocabulary of the 16th century is inconceivable without Augustine first giving the vocabulary to the West of sin, free will, and a meditation on our inability to choose God and of the need for grace and justification and God's predestination to work on us from the outside in. Another doctrine that Augustine is significantly important in shaping. It's our second category. It's the sacraments and the church. Well, Augustine's meditations on the church itself are equally as important for the shaping of Western perspectives on this. Just as Augustine against Pelagius was provoked into thinking long and hard about grace and justification, so too on the subject of the church and the sacraments, it was another controversy that provoked Augustine to think about this, and that was the controversy of Donatism. Now, just to recap, Donatism is a heresy or a schism in North Africa that comes out of the persecution times of the 4th century, in which the Church of Donatus, as they called themselves, believed that the church was too mixed with sinners. And they argued that only true Christians, only those who are pure, may be members of the church. And more importantly, the sinlessness, the blamelessness of the clergy is mandatory in order for the sacraments to be effective. Meaning, if God's grace is going to come in baptism or in the Eucharist, or in any of the actions of the pastor or the priest, then the pastor or the priest must be blameless. They argue, in other words, that if the priest has immorality in his heart or in his soul or in his actions, then the entire effectiveness of his ministry is gone. Sin, in other words, nullifies any of the work of ministry, period. And so the Donatists believed that they had a pure church, and that they had separated themselves from the band of sinners that were part of the regular church in North Africa. Well, Augustine comes at this in a number of different ways. First and foremost, Augustine's meditations on what we call ecclesiology, which is the doctrines of the church, focus long and hard on the subjects of the mixture of sinner and saint within the church. Augustine comprises his argument this way. He says, on the one hand, there is one church. But on the other hand, he says, the church is visible and invisible. It is the wheat and the tares. In fact, that parable of the wheat and the tares becomes Augustine's primary vehicle for understanding the church. He says the church is mixed with wheat and tares, and until Christ comes again, attempting to separate the two and to have a pure church is folly. It's impossible, he said. And this is important because what Augustine manages to do by this meditation is to uphold the desire for purity in the church. He doesn't shrug his shoulders, in other words, and say, ah, who cares? Let's just all be sinners and saints. It doesn't matter. He holds out that there should be one church and one ideal. But he also, and frankly, this has to be driven by his concept of grace, he says that the church will always be a mixture of sinner and saint, or wheat and tares. Similarly, Augustine goes full bore against this idea that the sin of the priest somehow makes null and void his invocation of the sacraments at the Lord's Supper and baptism, or in any of the priestly functions that he serves in the church. Augustine is really wise on this. He notices that if you start chucking out pastors because they have sin, eventually you're going to have a pastorate of zero. (laughs) And more importantly, Augustine realized that to make the effectiveness of ministry in the church dependent only on the moral sanctity of the men holding that office, is to deny the authority and the priesthood of Christ in the life of the believer. No, the priest is a under-shepherd serving on behalf of the one true shepherd, Christ. And therefore, Augustine says, to say that the sacraments which are instituted by the Lord himself and the ministry of the church, which is overseen by Christ through the instrument of the Spirit, to make that dependent on the sinfulness of a human is to deny the sovereignty of our Lord. And Augustine gives us some vocabulary, which we still use to this day, and it is the doctrine of ex opero operato, which literally in Latin means by the working of the work, which is a bit of a a twist of words there. And what Augustine means by this phrase is he says that the sacraments, 
and the ministry of priests is not dependent on their moral sanctity in and of itself, but rather on the sanctity and the lordship of Christ, and that what they're doing is working the work. That is to say, they are invoking the sacraments, they are doing ministry, and because it is Christ who guarantees the effectiveness of this ministry, not the people, not the humans, therefore the mere working of the work by the priest, even if that priest is still a sinner and has problems and is a broken man, the working of the work, because Christ guarantees it, means that we can trust in the sacraments and we can trust in the ministry of the church as not being dependent on this one priest or this one man to live morally pure, or else it all goes to hell in a handbasket. And thirdly and lastly, uh, Augustine is one of the more important and engaging thinkers on the relationship of Christians and culture, or Christians to the surrounding world, whether it's predominantly Christian or not. And we've noted before that Augustine lives really at the tail end of the western half of the Roman Empire, that in 430 at his death, there were actually barbarian tribes, Germanic tribes, that were besieging the city, and eventually after his death, the city would fall into their hands. And Augustine was really keen on the subject of where Christians place their hope. In fact, one of the more important books that Augustine ever wrote is a really lengthy book, but one of the more rewarding reads in the history of Christian writing. And that book is The City of God. And Augustine lays out an essential paradigm that Christians had frankly forgotten, in a manner of speaking, up until his day, after the coming of Constantine and the fusion of church and empire during the Constantinian Revolution. And in The City of God, Augustine lays out a real strident critique of those Christians who place their hope in the kingdoms of this world. Augustine says that power and influence and favor from the political state is a temporary and a passing thing. In other words, Augustine pulls the lens back and asks Christians to consider the entire scope of human history, and in particular, the entire scope of the vicissitudes of the ups and downs of the people of God both in the Old Testament and in the New, as well as in the centuries of the church between the New Testament and the time of Augustine. And Augustine doesn't denigrate or deride the role of the political order. He affirms it. He says it's there by God, it's there to restrain evil, and it's a gift of God if it's used to its proper ends. Augustine, though, argues pretty forcefully, though, that whenever Christians put their hope and their security in the power of the state, that inevitably they're going to be disappointed in the outcome. And he says, echoing Paul in the book of Philippians, that we are not citizens of this earth and therefore do not identify with the political order of this earth. Rather, we are citizens of heaven and our king is Jesus, and therefore our relationship to the political orders around us can never be a replacement or a surrogate for the hope that we have in the kingdom of our Lord. Christians, he says, are to understand that they sit in the scope of a larger story the story of the kingdom of Christ come down, and in the end, how all things will be put under his feet. And therefore, while we might know victory and success and comfort and peace for a time, Augustine says that these things are never to be assumed. Also within the relationship of Christians and culture, Augustine talks a great deal about violence and war and the relationship of Christians to warfare itself. And this is actually one of the most important enduring legacies that Augustine leaves to the Western world itself, even to the point of today, where secular political philosophies still engage pretty aggressively with Augustine's theory of the just war. What Augustine gives to the world is really a two-stage understanding of the Christian's relationship to the violence of the world around us. First and foremost, he talks about the issues of private violence. And then, in the end, he turns to the public understanding of violence itself. In, in the case of private violence, Augustine says that Christians are to be essentially pacifist. And it's no wonder where he gets this. It's the churn the other cheek doctrine that Christ gives us in the Gospels. It's the idea that we are not to revenge ourselves on any individual or any group. If we are individually wronged, Augustine says the biblical teaching is to endure it and to pray for our enemies. He does crack the door a bit, though, to the subject of self-defense. And this is very important because what he says is at times evil assaults us to such an extent 
that the repelling of that violence or the protection of ourselves or our loved ones is at times allowable. To use a modern example, Augustine would be okay if someone violently broke into our homes, let's say, and was threatening to murder our families, if we were to fight back or to use violence to stop this. That is to say, he does not believe in private vindication of alleged harms, or even serious harms at times. But he does open the door to the sense of defense that so many of us take for granted today, at least in the North American context. So that's how Augustine understands the private understanding of violence or the Christian's relationship to the outside world in terms of defending oneself. Still, though, he has a really important and a long meditation on the Christian's relationship to the external civic order. It is Augustine who is among the first, and certainly the most influential, to argue that Christians, if they are to serve their political orders, may serve in the military. And he gets at this by saying that a Christian who is a soldier is not a soldier by dint of the fact that he is simply going after his enemies. Rather, he is performing a role on behalf of the state, and any violence he might be doing against another person, Augustine argues, is not his own personal vendetta, and therefore he is simply doing his job or his calling. Now, this had been an argument that had been part of the Christian ethos or the Christian discussion all the way back to its earliest days. Inevitably, certain men in the army were converted, and there was a long-standing anxiety about whether these men should leave the army immediately because their primary role was to conduct violence. And Augustine gives the answer that has stood in the West ever since, which is that so long as the person is not acting against conscience or committing atrocities or these kinds of things, that the Christian is simply fulfilling his duty on behalf of the society or the state that they are a part of. Similarly, Augustine has the most influential discussion on the theory of the just war in the entirety of the West. Actually, it's Augustine who actually gives us the phrase, just war. And again, Augustine's argument is twofold. He says that Christians individually are pacifist, but rather there are opportunities and requirements of the state to engage in a war. And Augustine lays out two main principles for this. First of all, he says a war must be defensive. It must not be preemptive or destructive in the sense of trying to take over one's neighbor for the sake of one's own gain or advantage. But rather, if there is sufficient evil, if there is an attack upon your nation, that a just war is a defensive war. And secondly, he argues that not all violence is evil, and he uses Romans 13 and other texts of the scriptures to argue that at times God calls upon the political orders of the day to enact his purposes. Now, the long-standing history and the debate on this, of course, is mostly centered around the question of what is a defensive war? Is it only when your nation, your plot of land as a nation is attacked? Or are there possibilities for a defensive war that, in a manner of speaking, is on the offensive to go in and secure another piece of land or to go in and stop someone because they are themselves evil internally. And obviously, the long history of the 20th century has borne many of these issues out, which is why Augustine is still a resource for people even down to this day. But Augustine's theory of the just war carves out a space in which war is allowable, and yet he places the priority amongst Christians on peace and nonviolence. Therefore, in a manner of speaking, Augustine is able to argue for both, peace and yet a possibility of there being just causes for violence, given that it is a sinful and a fallen world. So that's the theology of Augustine in an overview. Now, obviously, we've only scratched the surface of what he has to say about these subjects, and there are some that fell off the table for the sake of time. But in the end, we can say that Augustine is one of the most important and one of the most influential thinkers in the West, and that his thinking again and again, and his writings again and again and again, are some of the principal resources for Christians and theologians and philosophers as they consider their own day. Mm-hmm.